Okay, well thank you for coming and literally braving the storm. So what we wanted to do today is talk a little bit about how we have uh, evolved in our care for cancer patients. And what I'm going to say to you may be a little shocking, but uh, Dr. Hugh Reardon, who uh, was, of course, the founder of the clinic, uh, had a friend in Japan who was a pathologist, a Japanese pathologist. And he ran an experiment. I don't know how long the experiment went, went or how many people he actually tested, but he decided at one point to carefully look on every autopsy he did for cancer. And if he looked hard enough and far enough in everyone that had died, for whatever reason, he could find cancer cells in their body. And this led Dr. Reardon to believe, and many people would say this is true, is that we all have cancer cells in our body. The question is, why doesn't everyone get cancer? And my answer is, you start to look around, you're beginning to think that everyone is getting cancer because you start uh, talking to relatives and friends. It's becoming much more common in our time than it ever was in the past. And, and this is in spite of the fact that there has been a huge war on cancer. Um, if you look at this statistic right here, uh, the death rates from heart disease between 1950 and 2005 have decreased dramatically, as have the death rates from stroke and cerebrovascular disease, influenza, and pneumonia. The, the change has been l much less striking for cancer, and this is in spite of huge efforts on the part of the government and the National Institute of Health and tons and tons of uh, various uh, philanthropic agencies pouring money into research. The, the rate of cancer has not gone down. And what I want to explore with you today is why is that so and why does it make sense for us to begin to look at prevention. And I'm not going to use the word treatment per se because what we do here is what, what we call adjunctive care. We're not trying to promote ourselves as a specific treatment, curative treatment for cancer. We're, we're looking upon what we have to offer as something that will help whatever else you decide to do uh, from either a conventional perspective or otherwise in the care of your cancer if you have been diagnosed with cancer. But I want you to see that uh, we're talking about a continuum here, that if it is true that cancer cells are ubiquitous in the human race, and I'm going to talk about why I think that's so, then in a sense we're all in this together. And, uh, and whether or not you have a diagnosis of cancer, you need to be thinking about how you can prevent your body from manifesting or expressing the theoretically present uh, cancer cells that are there. So this, these two things, prevention and adjunctive care, go hand in hand and they're, they're part of a continuum. And where you are may just be a matter of your age, a matter of time, a matter of toxicity, circumstances, many number of factors that go into how cancer presents itself. So I'm going to ask the question in terms of the type of care that we provide here at the Reardon Clinic. What, what do these two approaches, preventive and adjunctive, have in common? And it shouldn't be a big surprise that here we are helping our patients uh, focus on their lifestyles. And by lifestyles, I mean nothing, other, nothing more simple than just taking better care of yourself. That's a, that's a very simple definition of lifestyle, the choices you make to take better care of yourself. Now I'm going to just spend a minute, and this to me is a very powerful concept that maybe you've heard this before, but there are really three types of choices that you make. And the most important one is what, what uh, Robert Fritz calls the, the, the fundamental choices. And there, it's really a choice, but it's, it's a committing yourself to a certain state of being. Uh, saying, hey, I'm, I'm planned to be free, I plan to be healthy, 
I'm going to be true to myself, and I'm going to create the life that matters to me. And it's if you if you want to have a really powerful experience, just say that say those four things to yourself right now. That this you are committing yourself to these states of being, because very few people have said I'm going to be healthy no matter what. Um, people just assume it. They say, well, yeah, everyone wants to be healthy, don't they? Well, yeah. But I want you to think about this as a fundamental choice in your life that you are committing yourself to. And then I add the fifth one, to be well. And I'm going to expound on that just a little bit because to be well to me represents all four of these, these other uh, fundamental choices that this slide projects. Now, in order to reach that fundamental choice, you have to make primary choices, and there's all kinds of primary choices, and it just kind of depends upon where you're at at any given time, but it's the choices you make that serve your fundamental choice. So uh, if you make a primary choice to go after quality of life or to eat uh, whole foods or to uh, achieve a remission in a cancer, if you've got a cancer and your goal is to uh, go shoot for remission, that's a primary choice that you're making that serves the fundamental choice to be healthy or to be well. Uh, having energy and stamina or having good control of inflammation and pain, these, these can be primary choices. They're very individual, you know, it's a choice you make uh, in the context of your own life. Then there's a whole bunch of secondary choices. So once you've made a, a goal or a primary choice that serves a fundamental choice, then you've got all these little things that you need to do. It'd be like me when I, at some point in my life, I said, I want to be a doctor. That's a primary choice. Well, to do that, I had to go to college, go to high school, go to college, get accepted to medical school, study and take all those tests, do all the things that it takes to become a doctor. Those are all secondary choices. They are important, but they are based upon your, on, first of all, you have to make the, the key choice. If you, if you don't really know whether or not you want to become a doctor, there's a, there's a good chance you won't <laughs> because it's not easy to get through all those steps. And for all of you that have chosen any career path or made any major choice in your life, you all know that it's you know, starting a business or something like that. These are primary choices that there's a lot of other choices involved in making that go. But yet, they are important and they're, they, they depend upon your own unique circumstances. But these are some examples of if you made a choice to be uh, optimally healthy. Uh, you, you may need to learn a little bit more about nutrition or about exercise or about stress management. If you've got a, 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 a cancer and you've made some specific, some, a primary choice that you're going to shoot for remission from that cancer, you may have to work with may have to seek out a special oncologist if that's, if that's going to help you in the process of gaining that remission. Using IV vitamin C, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, is a secondary choice. It's not, it's not a fundamental choice. It's just something that we have found is helpful for you to achieve the results that you want to achieve. Now, within these choices, I, I created, I didn't create this, but I forget where I first learned about this, but uh, there is a continuum that we all go through from what I call illness to wellness. And the, it's very easy to understand when someone is ill or sick and not sick, okay? And that's, everyone pretty much understands that. And basically when you go to your doctor, that's really all he's concerned about is if you're not sick, he's happy with your care. You know, he's basically done his job in his mind. But but here we're kind of going a step further because we also know that there are people who are not well, but most people, if you said, would you like to be well? I mean, I think that's a, a natural state of being that people would like to have. I mean, if, if it was offered to them and said, would you like to be well? Yeah, I want to be well. But not very many people have chosen it as a fundamental state of being that they want to be in. So, so most of the time they kind of let circumstances guide their lives Whereas this is, this is clearly a choice that you're making. But when you put this into quadrants, it's kind of interesting. You run into people that are in different, what I call, states. And we know a lot of people who are ill and not well. And they're the ones that are running to the doctor and they never seem to get well. There are a lot of chronically ill patients. They're ill and they're not well and they just never seem to get well. Uh, there are those people who are not ill 
but they're not really interested in being well. They're just hoping that they never get ill. They're not taking very much of a proactive stance about it. They're just hoping they don't get sick. But then what's interesting is when you get into this, this wellness column, I know a lot of patients who are ill, but they've made that choice that I'm going to be well, or I am well. And they may have a serious illness at the same time, and I'm sure you guys know them too. They're people who are living life more consciously, making day-to-day uh, -day choices in favor of their wellness and not letting the illness guide their lives. And I have many cancer patients who have cancer, but in many ways they are more well than they've ever been because they have made that fundamental choice that they're not going to let the cancer overcome them or dominate their lives. And then, of course, a very wonderful state to get in is to not be ill and to be well. And I don't think there's very many people that actually live in this state. I mean, most of us are dealing with something, whether it's a headache or an achy shoulder or some kind of symptom within the body. So in many ways, uh, we, I think most of, I, I think this is not an unusual space to be in. And of course, we would, you know, it's, it's good to aim for the not ill and well. But uh, so anyway, it'd be, it's interesting to look at this and ask yourself, where am I in this continuum? So this is, this kind of led Dr. Reardon to the notion that when patients with cancer come here, we're not really primarily treating their cancer, which when I first give them this quote of his that we don't tra treat cancer here, we treat patients who have cancer, he's shifting the focus from the disease to the patient who has the disease. And he's wanting them actually to shift from the focus on the illness to the wellness, in my, as my understanding of what Dr. Reardon was, was all about, and, and that in making that fundamental choice to be well, there's other choices that come right along with that in terms of uh, overcoming the illness and learning about nutrition and doing things like IV vitamin C or having your nutrient levels tested. These are all in line with someone who has made that fundamental choice to be well and to take better care of themselves. The lifestyle medicine that we were referring to earlier. So just to kind of compare and contrast, and this is, not, this is not a value judgment slide, but if you are going to an oncologist or receiving conventional care for your cancer, uh, you're, obviously you're going to expect the oncologist to treat your, your disease, treat the disease. Well here, we're going to focus on caring for you as a patient. And your oncologist is going to determine the grade and stage of the tumor, which is, that's very important we're gonna search for and try to correct the underlying causes of that particular tumor. Uh, a regular doctor wants to kill those cancer cells. I'm, I'm, I'm all in favor. I mean, no one wants to let the cancer stick around. You wanna try to get rid of it. But we wanna focus on strengthening your healthy cells because we think that's just as important as trying to get rid of the cancer cells and it may be an integral part of sustaining a remission. A lot of what conventional medicine does creates more oxidative stress in your body, we're going to try to lessen that oxidative stress through a number of different strategies. And whereas your oncologist does kinds of research that primarily focus on how long you survive, the quantity of your survival, we would like for, to look at what we can do to improve the quality of your life and enhance that as part of this uh, box four or box three, you know, shifting towards uh, a wellness orientation. Now what about the cause of cancer, the genesis of cancer? And just a very simple definition that we've adopted that cancer appears to be a maladaptive cellular response to sustained injury. And, and I'll get into a discussion of how we all experience injury. We all experience the, the hard knocks in the school of life. And, and Dr. Reardon's son, Neil Reardon, and Xiaolong Ming, who was one of our researchers here years ago, uh, came up with the concept of the non-healing wound, that cancer is like a wound, but it doesn't quite have what it needs in order to completely heal. And then this led Dr. Reardon, of course, to talk in terms of how all of us get cancer, like I, like I started the presentation. And this is not just his idea. Uh, there's a very popular bestseller 
uh, written by a physician, Dr. David Sarvan Schreiber, called Anti-Cancer, A New Way of Life. And he says, all of us have cancer cells in our bodies, but not all of us will develop cancer. Why not? And uh, we'll come back to talking about his book in just a minute, but he also has, he was a doctor who, uh, deve who developed a brain tumor and uh, had it surgically removed. He, he followed the conventional route and had it surgically removed, and two years later it came back. And so he decided he hadn't done enough. Now he went ahead and had it removed again, but this time he just dove into the study of lifestyle and all the factors that influence uh, the context of cancer. Cancer always develops in a context. It doesn't just happen out of nowhere, even though it seems like it when the doctor comes in and says, you have cancer, it seems like just out of nowhere you got it. But if you go back and analyze the steps of your life and the the toxic exposures and maybe the dietary patterns and the lack of sleep and the broken relationships and gosh knows what else we all, all the injuries that we deal with in our lives, you can begin to put together a pattern that may have led you to the cancer manifesting in your, in your body. So speaking of these patterns in life, uh, I've, in my just thinking about what happens to ourselves in the course of living, there's, there's five steps that we go through probably every minute, every moment of every day this is happening, and it happens in bigger cycles as well. But, you know, we, we, uh, we kind of assume we're healthy, you know, that's kind of the normal, we hope that's the normal state of life, and very typically something happens that injures us. Injury is kind of part of life. And, uh, and I always think of if you hit your finger with a hammer, that's a pretty typical injury that most of us has have experienced and so and by golly there is a signal you do know when you have hit your finger with the hammer and that signal actually draws a, a process an inflammatory process to the site of the injury so that the body can begin repairing the damage that was done to those cells and through a process of repair renourishment healing uh, the body starts to heal and because most of us would not doubt that that finger is going to heal. If we cut ourselves, we wouldn't doubt that the cut would heal. It's, it's interesting that with cancer, many of us have doubts as to whether or not we can heal a cancer. But most things, we, when we hurt ourselves, we assume they're going to heal, and typically they do, and we're back to health. So this is a, this is a cyclic process that is just part of the nature of life. Now with cancer, it's a little bit different. And so let's take these different steps and look at them one by one. So what would be the types of injuries that would set you up for cancer? Well, there could be any kind of <clears throat> physical injury, you know, radiation. You know, we're concerned about the, our Japanese friends and the, uh, the amount of radiation exposure that, uh, around the nuclear plant because we know that excessive nuclear and radiation exposure will create the risk of cancer. Electromagnetic fields are in the news you know, that that could be a factor. Chronic trauma, any kind of an irritant, um, a, a mesothelioma of the lung is due to asbestos getting into your lung cells, or smoking is a kind of an irritant in the, in the lung cells that sets you up for lung cancer. Uh, chronic chemical injury, the carcinogens, the toxic chemicals, heavy metals, pesticides, biological injuries like chronic infection, parasites, bacterial infections, overactivity, oh, an overactive inflammatory response, people who are chronically inflamed. There's actually quite a bit of research coming out now that chronic inflammation is at the base of many cancers. Depletion of growth and repair molecules. This was a Dr. Roger Williams concept is that when you lost some of the key chemicals, the ability of the cells to regulate themselves were, were hampered and so they couldn't repair properly. And we all know that chronic emotional or mind-body injuries, whether it's stress, depression, lack of purpose, loss of meaning, and loss of human connectedness, these kinds of things can set people up for cancer. And many of you have heard of someone who is, some drastic thing has happened in a marriage or in a, in a life, or some, some very important person has died, or some business has failed, and not too much longer after that, the, the cancer seems to show up. So it's not always that way, and very often it can be a combination of, of, these, of these four realms. But what happens is the wound that occurs with the injury 
somehow doesn't heal. It's the non-healing wound. And so this injury sets up a series of signals. And it turns out these signals have a common basis. When we look at all the factors, if you, if you, have, if you look at a person who has cancer, these are the factors that influence how, what their likelihood of overcoming the cancer is or what their outcome is going to be. Their age, uh, do they have a strong family history? Do they have good or bad nutritional status? Do they smoke or not? Are they exposed in their work or in their environment to carcinogens? It's interesting, if you look at maps of the United States, there's higher incidence of cancer in the industrial east than there is in the, in the west and southwest. Exercise and fitness definitely falls into this. Sleep is a major factor. I think there, one of the problems in our day and age is people are not getting enough sleep. We have too many bright screens that we look at in the middle of the night. Uh, radiation exposure, comorbidity. You can have diabetes or heart disease or other chronic diseases that are adding to your stress. Financial stresses, family system disruption. Let me tell you, any one of you that has dealt with a cancer in your family, it definitely does disrupt the family system. Uh, your belief structure, how, what do you believe? What's the best way to handle it? You know, are you being punished? For, are you, were you a bad person? You know, or, or, you know, or is this just uh, an accident of nature? Fear and depression enter into it, the stage of the cancer at diagnosis, stage at presentation, tumor burden, do you have a large amount of tumor burden, how much pain are you in, how much chemotherapy and radiation have you undergone. All of these have a common denominator, and it's called oxidative stress. And so the worse these factors are, the more oxidative stress your body has to deal with. And really, oxidative stress is that signal. It's the body kind of saying, help, you know, things are getting rough here, help. The water's getting hot. And so, the, so we have the injury, we have the signal, and then we have the repair process. The body will attempt to repair the cancerous process. And we've done some very innovative research here where we've been able to use a special testing procedure to look at the signaling that the body puts out whenever there is injury. And these are called cytokines. They are, they are little peptide molecules that the injured site sends out to draw the inflammatory system to where the uh, problem is. It's almost like when there's a, a break-in, you know, and the alarms go off, the police cars start coming to the, to the alarm. And so, uh, however, when, if you have a depletion of your nutrient reserves and the damage is not being repaired, the signal just gets louder. It'd be like that alarm, you know, the, the building has been broken into It'd be like if the police didn't show up in one minute, the sound of the alarm doubles. And if they didn't show up in two minutes, the sound of the alarm gets tripled. And so what happens with the inflammation system, if, it's, if the injury is not fixed, the inflammatory response becomes stronger and stronger. And that becomes one of the problems of cancer, that inflammation actually can drive the cancer. And uh, when we look at these different cytokines, they all have different functions within the body. One set of signals is there to try to heal the wound, and it turns out that in a cancer patient, these are highly activated. Uh, the signals that would turn off the healing, that would reduce the inflammation, they're kind of down. If you look at the totals over here compared to the totals over here, there's a lot more signals here th that are to heal the wound. And a lot of what we call oncogenes, these are the genes that turn on so-called regulate cancer, they're really not regulating cancer. They are the genes that are trying to regulate the healing response. And when you have cancer, they are in high alert, really going on strong. So there's a lot of signaling going on during the cancerous process. So we have injury, signal, attempt to repair, and hopefully the thing heals. But Dr. and, and, and part of what Dr. Xiaolong Ming was able to show is that one of the things that we do that, we just, that Dr. Reardon did a lot of research in is that intravenous vitamin C can take these cytokine signals and kind of tone them down. It, deri it drives these signals in the direction of healthier and more normal. And so he found that a 70, one, just even one 75 gram IVC caused a dramatic shift in cytokine activity towards normal. He showed that 22 of the cytokine categories were improved after a series of IV vitamin Cs. So this is some of the research that we sh 
have that shows us that if we can give the body what it needs to help promote the healing process, we can begin to balance out these excessive signals that are where it's driving inflammation and driving the cancer to perpetuate. So this is all part of a, a program. This is a little bit of history here. Part, back in 1990, Dr. Hugh Reardon launched uh, RECNAC, which is, uh, it, it stands for Research Encompassing Novel Approaches to Cancer. And it just happens to be the word cancer spelled backwards, you know, to reverse the trends in cancer. And it's a comprehensive biological research that's intent on discovering the underlying causes of cancer. And its goal was to find non-toxic adjunctive treatment modalities for cancer patients. So this was all started in the 90s. This is just a year after I got here. So you can see where my terminology is coming from, that we provide adjunctive care. We're trying to look for non-toxic ways to help the body heal. And many of these non-toxic avenues are based upon patients becoming actively involved in the discovery process to where they are learning more about how to take care of themselves. These are choices that you can make to take better care of yourself. You don't have to wait until you get cancer. Matter of fact, I'd recommend you don't. I would recommend you take the notion that maybe you already have cancer cells in your body, which as I started out, we probably all do. And why not provide yourself optimal cancer care before you get cancer in hopes that you can be one of the people that do not express the cancer cell in their lifetime. So 15 years of vitamin C research. We published over 20 scientific articles on IVC and cancer. These are all available at our website. Uh, we, we, it, this inspired the formation of REC, RECNAC2 at the University of Puerto Rico. Uh, the, the doctors there did a very nice review of the, the approach of using vitamin C in cancer. Uh, that was published in Integrative Cancer Thera Therapies. That's also available for you to read on our website. Um, we found that uh, oral vitamin C, <clears throat> which is typically given in low oral doses, does not produce the blood levels of, of ascorbate that are sufficient to kill tumor cells. However, high vitamin C, when you give it intravenously, demonstrates what's called selective cytotoxicity. It will kill tumor cells in vitro for sure. Tumor cells become susceptible to high dose vitamin C at plasma levels of 350 to 400 milligrams per deciliter. How do we know that? Here is a, one of the famous findings of that research that if you take four different line, cell lines of cancer cells, human cancer cells, and grow them, and here's 100% survival up here, but as you start increasing the amount of vitamin C in the culture dish, the survival rate of those cells goes down. And by the time you hit 400, 350 to 400, almost all of the cancer cells are no longer surviving. So that is what's called selective cytotoxicity because that, if you have normal cells present, this, this phenomenon does not happen. And without getting into a lot of discussion, the the normal cells produce an enzyme called catalase, which protects them from the effects of high-dose vitamin C. We'll go into that in just a minute here. So we did this original research, but it was replicated at the National Institute of Health and published in the prestigious Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences under the title of Pharmacologic Ascorbic Acid Concentrations Selectively Kill Cancer Cells. And it does this by delivering hydrogen peroxide to the tissues. Now, I promised I wouldn't get into a lot of chemistry, but I just have to show you a little. I'm a chemistry major, and I have to show you a little chemistry. Not much. Just enough to kind of whet your appetite. So anyway, some people have said, well, I thought vitamin C was an antioxidant. It is, and it will always be an antioxidant. All an antioxidant is is a molecule that donates electrons to a free radical. So free radicals tend to be harmful. They cause oxidative stress. So vitamin C donates its electrons and it's converted, it's uh, oxidized to dehydroascorbate and the free radical is neutralized. Now you can do that, this with any number of molecules. If we take iron, the oxidized form of iron and put vitamin C with it, we can reduce it to uh, the reduced form of iron, and then the dehydroscorbate is uh, eliminated in the kidneys. 
So here's, here's the magic. When you, when you uh, start putting in a lot of vitamin C, and the only, the only way this will work is if you put in a lot, and the only way you can get a lot in is intravenously. But if you put a lot of vitamin C in, and you reduce a lot of this iron, this reduced iron will react with oxygen in your body and start forming peroxide. And this was verified again by Dr. Levine at the National Institute of Health where he did a kind of, he had to invent a kind of tissue dialysis of rats where he gave them large doses of vitamin C intraperineally and then dialyzed their extracellular tissues and was able to prove that indeed the hydrogen peroxide was formed. And this is a diagram out of that uh, famous uh, publication showing how the vitamin C, uh, how it works with the iron and produces the hydrogen peroxide. And then the next step of this, if you put uh, even more iron in, uh, when the iron interacts, the reduced iron interacts with the hydrogen peroxide, it forms the hydroxyl radical. This is a very powerful pro-oxidant. So the vitamin C itself is not a pro-oxidant, but when you use enough of it and you start looping it into this, uh, into this uh, redo what's called redox cycling, if you keep dumping more vitamin C in and keep reducing the iron, you'll start forming more and more of this hydroxyl ion, this negative hydroxyl radical. And to me, this looks, in my mind, it looks like a, a, a water wheel. And, and as long as you're putting vitamin C in, the water wheel is turning and it's churning out the hydroxyl radical. And that's the pro-oxidant effect of high doses of vitamin C. And it depends upon the correct dose. And that's a lot of what we do here at the clinic when we see cancer patients and we give them a series of vitamin C infusion. We're, we're trying to determine what is the correct dose for that patient in order to achieve this hydroxyl radical formation. So we've talked about injury, signal, repair, a healing process. How do we get back to health? And uh, health, you know, is more than just the sum of the parts. It's a, it's a holistic state of being. It's not just the lack of cancer. It's, it's actually uh, a kind of wellness state. So we're back to state of being. And this is why when Dr. Reardon died, we sat down and asked ourselves, what did we learn about the Reardon approach to dealing with chronically ill patients. And I'm just going to give you in just real summary form some of the ideas that, that I felt like we gleaned from Dr. Reardon. Number one, he, he really felt that the, the relationship between the, the doctor and the patient was paramount in this healing process. And he, he wanted the patient to think of themselves as co-learners, which means it put the doctor and the patient on a kind of even ground with one another to where they were working together as partners in a process of discovery where the patient would learn and the, you know, what they needed to know and the doctor would learn about the, the uniqueness of the patient and that together they would discover pathways to better health. And the key to that was not to just treat the symptoms but to identify the actual underlying causes of the chronic symptoms because most of the patients that we see They've not just been sick for a short time, they've been sick for a long time. And so uh, you can go ahead and put Band-Aids over the tack that you've set on, but I think it's better to take the tack out. Uh, or to, if you're just taking aspirin, uh, that's not going to quite deal with the tack. So we, we're looking for tacks around here and trying to take them out. So there's all kinds of tacks. There's infections, digestive problems, emotional problems, nutrient deficiencies, toxins, inflammation, food issues. Uh, the patient's attitudes and beliefs, thyroid problems, low blood sugar, endocrine disruption, yeast overgrowth, adrenal exhaustion, underactivity, st stress, spiritual issues, environmental toxins, uh, and structural problems. And so these are all things that we attempt to identify. How are these at work with our patients? And very often it's not just one, it's several things working simultaneously to kind of hogtie the patient. And in order for us to do that, in order to make this identification, we have a tremendous advantage here at the Reardon Clinic. We have this fantastic laboratory that, where we can take our hypotheses as we're listening to the patients and we begin to get some ideas about what might be causing their problems. We can send them over to the lab and see whether or not what we think is going on really is. If I believe you have a 
zinc deficiency. It's great that I believe that. Does the lab verify that hypothesis? And very often we do find that nutrient deficiencies are a major factor. And in terms of our cancer patients, we know that uh, very often they are not having a full team of nutrients available to them. And Dr. Roger Williams felt that was a major part of cancer is that the body had lost its regulating nutrients, its power to regulate itself because it didn't have a full team of nutrients. And so sure enough, uh, looking at uh, governmental research, these are the, num the percent of people just eating a standard, Amer a standard American diet, uh, which is sad. Uh, that 73% do not have enough calcium, 75% do not consume enough folate, 68% not enough magnesium, 86% not enough vitamin E, and you can kind of look at the rest of these. So nutrient deficiencies are a common problem in our culture, and that's why we test for the micronutrients or the nutrients you can't see. And we look at antioxidant levels and omega fats, minerals, amino acids, uh, B vitamins, and special nutrient levels. So one of the things that we do with our, in our cancer care, it's an adjunctive lifestyle therapy is to use the lab to try to identify nutrient deficiencies. Because if you're fighting cancer, you need to have all the ammunition you can. You need to be, uh, as I tell people, I'd say, you know, you know, if you've ever tried to play a game of bridge and four or five of the cards were missing, you know, you're not playing with a full deck. And so I want people to be playing with a full nutrient deck if they're going to fight the, the disease of their life. And then the other important thing is inflammation, that we now know that inflammation, if it goes out of bounds and out of control, it feeds the fire of cancer. So we need to assess that with things like this C-reactive protein, the omega-6 to 3 ratio, your vitamin D level. We look at food sensitivities, antioxidant reserves. Even your lipids can kind of tell us a little bit about your, your inflammation status, and your blood sugar certainly has a role to play in that too. And this is why in Dr. David Sarvan's book, the biggest chapter, I think it's chapter two or three, but it's the biggest chapter is on anti-inflammatory foods and how your foods are one of the most important ways you can control the inflammation of cancer. And used to be 20 years ago, the American Cancer Society said that diet has nothing to do with cancer. And now if you see one of their posters, it kind of looks like the front of this book. It's got like all the different colorful fruits and vegetables. And we know that phytonutrients, which are very powerful uh, antioxidants that work together as a team, that they can have a powerful influence in keeping us out of the development of cancer. We may have the cancer cells in our body, but if we have the right nutrition, the body seems to know what to do to control the cancer. And that's what we're working on here. That's the shift in thinking that occurs here at our clinic compared to uh, most, most uh, oncologists. We also look upon people as, a whole, as our patients as a, as a whole person. It's not just the cancer. It's, it's how this affects your life, how this affects your family, uh, how this affects you know, just your, your being. So this truly is a lifestyle form of medicine. And when people come here, they may be here where they're really, they've got most of their thought process in what can the field of medicine do for me? And what, here's what I can do for myself. Here's my lifestyle choices. But by the time they've spent some time with us, they'll shift over to here where they're, they, yes, we want to use the best that medicine has to offer. But now we're beginning to think, hey, we can make lifestyle choices that have a huge impact on the outcome of this particular condition. And if you don't have cancer yet, this type of shift can help you make better choices so that you're less likely to become a patient with cancer, that those cancer cells will stay quiescent and the body will continue to repair them or to uh, bind them up or whatever the body does, send the uh, white blood cells after them. But nevertheless, we want to kind of keep from the uh, cancer cells from expressing them in their, themselves in our lives. If they do, the process is the same. The adjunctive care that we give here, it's just the same sort of thing. We're trying to help the individual's body produce its own healing response. And, uh, and that can be very useful, even if they're undergoing other forms of therapy. And, and to me, 
Uh, IV vitamin C, which I, did, I don't have a slide on this, but IV vitamin C will actually augment the effectiveness of chemotherapy as well as reducing side effects. So we have research on that. So again, this shift, we're shifting from the focus on the disease to the health of the person, and that health is itself a treatment strategy. We're shifting out of illness, you know, this is where people come in at, they're focusing on the illness, and we're getting them to shift their focus into wellness or positive choices that, where you start to identify yourself as a well person. Even if you have cancer, you can be a well person with cancer. So lifestyle medicine shift from treating symptoms to treating the causes. Uh, lifestyle medicine, instead of just waiting for the disease to show in case you don't have cancer, rather than just passively waiting, cultivate habits of health. This is what lifestyle is about, that you are making active choices in your day-to-day -day life, even if you make a little choice every day. I, I remember growing up, the nuns used to teach me, just be a little bit better today, Ronnie. <laughs> <coughs> Just a little bit better. You know, do some, you know, try to treat your friends a little better or you know, eat a, make better food choices or read a book on nutrition or try to get to bed a little earlier. It, just little things. And it's, it's not what you do today really that makes the difference. It's what you do every day. But what you do today is helping you cultivate daily habits of health. And that is the key to long-term wellness, cultivation of daily habits of health. I think I have time to tell. I think I do. Uh, well, maybe I don't. I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell it some other time because I want to go. Tell it. Tell it. Uh, shouldn't have said it. Uh, Stephen Covey in The Seven Habits of Effective People makes a good point. He says one of the worst things that college education does to its graduates, some of them, is that they can goof off the whole semester and cram and in the last few days before the final stay up all night and then take the test and pass it as if they've learned something, right? Ask a farmer to do that. Can a farmer do that? Can they just kind of goof off the whole growing season and then at the very end throw some seeds out and try to expect a harvest? No, you have to kind of do everything in sequence. And this is what we're learning about what I call biological health. What we do here is biologically sound. We're helping people cultivate those little habits, better diet, better lifestyle, get the nutrients in, get adequate sleep. These are all the things that biologically help your system get stronger so you're less likely to get cancer. Or if you do have cancer, it's gonna help the healing mechanisms reverse it. So this is where we engage you as co-learners. And this is kind of a web of choices. It's not just one thing, it's, it's a web. And so it takes a while to kind of get onto this and to really bring it into full force in your life. But as you start to gain momentum, these things all of a sudden start making a whole lot of sense and it gets easier and easier to do. So food is the ultimate medicine. And so many of our, of our people uh, are caught in these vicious cycles of stress, uh, poor eating, low blood sugar, over time uh, gaining the central obesity, <coughs> feeling defeated in that, in that state. Uh, they've lost muscle mass, they're weak, they're tired, they're not motivated, they have toxic livers, and it just becomes a vicious cycle that ends up uh, resulting in a huge uh, obesity epidemic here in the United States. And I just kind of put this in because this is one of the major risk factors for cancer. So uh, visceral fat is pro-inflammatory. And so if you've got, uh, if you've got the signs of, of pre-diabetes, uh, it's, it's worth looking into just working on that. I think if we can help people uh, lose that visceral fat, uh, we can reduce their risk for cancer, actually. Dr. Reardon was big on cultivating healthy reserves, and that's reserves of all kinds, good habits, good, good nutrient levels, adequate sleep, uh, adequate family support. All this is what I call healthy reserves, and then always kind of falling back on the healing power of nature as a fundamental way of, of helping you learn how to take better care of yourself. So my vote in the healthcare reform debate is for self-care reform, that we all learn how to take better care of ourselves and we would solve the nation's problems. <laughs> so I've, gonna, I've got uh, uh, one of our co-learners is here today and I'm gonna have 
Carol will come up in just a minute, but I have a, a video to show you that we produced here that really tells her story, and then we'll just do it. What do you do when you're hit with the big C, cancer? It's a shock. I was afraid of the treatment, is what I feared the most. And so I started reading, and I started asking people, and I got some very good advice. From the moment I checked into the Reardon Clinic, I was impressed. Dr. Ron says, the good thing about cancer is that you make a life change. The doctors care about you, not just your test results. They want to know about all of you, not just your cancer. And I got help. It was interesting to me from the start that the Reardon Clinic wanted me to be a co-learner. They wanted me to learn as much as I could about my cancer and all the ways in which I could be helped. Well, I hope I've learned a lot. Not only is the cancer gone from inside, everything has improved. Head to toe, skin, nails, hair, teeth, eyes, everything. I feel stronger than I did 20 years ago, which is amazing because I thought I was healthy then. The gratitude trail at the Reardon Clinic is a very important place. Beautiful trees and peace. There's a serenity that you don't feel everywhere. It's just peaceful. I got my life back. It's a very precious gift. I'm still learning and this old teacher wants to get an A+. What I wanted to ask you is, uh, you're still learning. What are you still learning besides not to go to the dentist? <laughs> I'm learning that um, all the troubles that I uh, started experiencing three years ago should have been the red flags that cancer was about to become evident. Um, this is just uh, a minor oral surgery and Dr. May says, I'm healing faster than expected. <laughs> Am I surprised? No, because I'm doing all the things that Dr. Ron taught me to do. And um, this is a minor bump in the road. Cancer is a big bump. <laughs> a big bump. Okay. Um, so have you been able to kind of sustain the things pretty well? Did, did, did the cancer still is under good control? Sure. And the cancer doesn't have a chance. <laughs> but I've learned so much. Question? What were the red flags you were talking about? Well, um, a year before I was diagnosed, I had some dental issues that were first time. I had always had superior dental health, very few cavities and no complications. Suddenly, everything was falling apart. <laughs> Um, not just because I hit 60, but because um, my mother was dying. There were a lot of toxic things going on in the family. Hmm. Uh, I had dental problems that I'd never had before. 
and my joints were creaking and groaning. I was, uh, I could pop every finger and toe. <laughs> I was a walking uh, percussion instrument. Um, I had a difficulty with uh, shoulder and wrist that I thought could be cured with chiropractic, and it couldn't. There just seemed to be problem after problem and uh, my eyes started to um, have floaters, which alarmed me. I thought, oh goody, a detached retina. <laughs> I didn't want that. I, um, sorry, I'm really a little self-conscious about this. Um, I had, um, hmm, arthritis, which I kind of expected because my grandmother had had it, and I didn't want it. There were just so many things that seemed to be breaking down, but I didn't connect the dots until I found the lump. So all of those things now seem to have been precursors or indicators that I was really not healthy, uh, and I had broken bones. So, so do you feel like you've kind of moved from that you know, not ill, not well, into more ill and well, or actually not ill, well, more well. <laughs> now? Now. All of those problems have gone, all of them. I don't creak and groan anymore. My eyes are much healthier. I was taking Julian Whitaker vitamins, and I thought it was wonderful that since I had long believed in that supplement at Reardon Clinic, it was a, that's not something that I would have to throw away. If I had gone to my oncologist and said, what about these vitamins? He would have laughed, unfortunately. Um, and some physicians did laugh mm -hmm. when I said, I don't want to go off these. Yeah. I, I didn't have to when I came to Reardon. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Well, um, I used to come here just because I liked the cafe. Please get another cafe. Um, and so I knew uh, where it was, but when I got the diagnosis, I didn't have a clue. I didn't know an oncologist. I didn't know a naturopath. I just knew I was in trouble. And um, for a, a typically cheery, positive person who usually at the grocery store is saying, hi, how are you? When the clerk asked me, hi, how are you? I choked up and couldn't answer. And for the first time, it wasn't, I'm fine. It was, oh my God, I'm in trouble. So I went to Food for Thought and said, where do I go? What do I do? Oh down the street. At that time it was called Bright Spot. Go to Bright Spot. I went straight to Bright Spot <laughs> and I have never regretted it. They received me with open arms. The whole atmosphere here is positive. I love the people here. They are totally supportive and I can't tell you enough good things about it. Okay, here's a uh, radiation or uh, chemotherapy or anything? <laughs> oh, that's what I was afraid of. I had seen many people suffer the effects of those treatments. So I asked what kind of surgery I would need. Well, they said if you have a total mastectomy, then you will not have to have radiation. So I said, fine, do that. Well, I did that. The surgery was perfect. I love my surgeon. All was well with that. However, afterward, just to make sure, and who, who knows for what other reasons, I was told I would have to have either tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor because my cancer in the breast was estrogen positive. Ugh. That's when I, I asked about the Rudin Clinic because I was so afraid of that chemotherapy. I did start my IV vitamin C treatments here 
and at the same time started on the lesser of two things that were offered. I refused to take tamoxifen. I'd read too many ridiculous things about it. The other drug that was offered was extraordinarily strong. I read up on it and I thought, oh my goodness, the things that, that could do to damage my body, I don't want. And I was pressed to join a double-blind study. A double-blind study is not what I wanted to do. If I had taken that option, yes, I would have had help paying for the drug, but I would not know what was going into my body. I already knew that I would need vitamin D, that that would be terribly important to protect my bones. I did not want to take a biphosphonate drug, which the oncologist pressed me to do, and now we're seeing all over television lawsuits against the companies that make Fosamax and Boniva and these sorts of drugs that really don't help your bones, they cement your bones. Your bones are supposed to be living, and they can't with these drugs. So I didn't want that drug. I didn't want a double-blind study. I agreed to take a less strong drug, Arimidex, and I stayed on that for seven months, and the side effects of it were not terrible, but they were enough that I thought, this is bad. This is not good for my body. And so I finally stopped after seven months because I had the courage. I had the confidence that I was building my strength, that I was keeping the cancer in check, and it can't get me. Plus we also, didn't we recommend like indole 3 carbonyl and ver we, there are various ways you can Grape seed extract. Grape seed extract, various things you can do to mimic aromatase inhibitors and mimic the effects of tox, uh, tamoxifen without going on the medicine. Now, we don't tell our patients, don't do what the oncologist says, but we do support our patients in their decision-making process and looking for alternatives. So it's not a, one of the things that some people misunderstand is it's not an us against them. It's more like what's important to you and what path do you want to take that we can help support you in and find reasonable alternatives that will uh, get you to where you want to go without fear of the potentially drastic side effects. So, and some people that come here are doing exactly what their oncologist says and doing the IVC in addition to that. Some of the oncologists are not in favor of IVC. Some, there's one has written a letter in favor of it. And so, but it's, it's, it's a very individual journey it's a very individual journey, and so we don't try to promote any one pathway other than we're here to help you figure out what's going to be best for you, given the context of your illness, your family situation. My wife had breast cancer, and her uh, sister and brother-in-law were both med techs from Hartford Hospital, and so there was a lot of pressure to, to do just exactly what the oncologist did, and it ended up we... we, we found a, a way and she did have pretty conventional therapy but she also did the IV vitamin C. So there's a way to find your way through the maze but it's nice to have someone on your side as you're looking for the path. How often did she have to take the IV? We recommend we have the Reardon IVC protocol which is the standard protocol in Japan I might mention. Uh, Japan is very, has taken off with this and there's over 400 doctors actively using the uh, the protocol that we that we that Dr. Reardon established here, and there are no, there are many doctors around the United States that are using it as well. Uh, the protocol calls for twice a week. Some patients do three times a week. Some patients do once a week, but the protocol calls for twice a week for the first several months, uh, depending upon what stage the cancer is, depending upon what kind of levels we get when we do the post IVC levels. And so this protocol is published on our website if you go to uh, research on the reardonclinic.org. Well, I want to thank Carol for being brave and coming up in front of you. Thank you, Carol, and being brave in general. Hope your tooth gets better. Thank I'm you. Sure it yeah. Will. <laughs> IBC. <clears throat> okay, any other questions? If not, uh, oh, some more questions. Yes, sir. What role do. Sorry.
What role do cancer stem, stem cells play in recurring cancer, and how do, does the pro-oxidant therapy like I, IV vitamin C affect cancer stem cells? Well, there's, it's, a very, it's a very good question. It's a very complex answer. It's, some of the research is indicating that tumor cells actually recruit stem cells from the bone marrow and convert them into cancer cells. And it may actually be uh, a, a kind of an aberration of the healing process because stem cells are meant to be for healing the body. But uh, if you have a non-healing wound and there's chronic inflammation and there's a lack of the regulatory nutrients, it could be this is why the stem cells themselves uh, convert into tumor-like cells. We don't know. Uh, in general, our, our, our major thrust of research is trying to make sure the, uh, the wound, the cancer, has what it needs to heal. So uh, it's, a, it's a, actually a kind of a flip. It's the opposite of what most people think. If, if people need to do chemotherapy, that's fine. The chemotherapy is a pro-oxidant also, and it basically is injuring the cells enough to where apoptosis, which is the, there's a function of injured cells to where they take themselves out. Uh, we, sometimes that's what chemotherapy does, is it pushes them such that the apoptosis occurs. The problem is you can get enough damage from the chemotherapy that the apoptosis mechanism itself becomes damaged and then you have perpetually dividing cells and this is what we think happens with a lot of tumor cells. What we recommend for people who have had cancer and are in remission is once a month. So if you have a fairly active risk factor for cancer and you're interested in the IVC, I would think in terms of maybe once a month or once every six weeks might be sufficient. My sister has cancer, and I've tried to get her to do the IB. She's in California, and she says that there's nothing around there that she can use. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was just trying to get her. Have, I know that, that just eating a little bit of uh, vitamin C probably isn't anything, but what would it do anything wrong if she would just uh, Take eat oral, the vitamin C? Oral vitamin, vitamin C? Uh -huh. I know it said here that it doesn't do any good, but I mean, what would be the consequences if she just ate it like candy every day? Uh, there actually have been some people, I, I know Erwin Stone reported on a case of a friend of his who had a prostate cancer who just every day kept increasing the amount of vitamin C he was taking by mouth and he had worked himself up to about 40 grams a day and, uh, and was in, he had, had no further progression of his cancer. Uh, I don't know if you can get her motivated enough to do that, that takes a lot of motivation. Uh, a little bit probably will keep her general health better. It may not do much to help prevent the progression of the cancer. Um, but again, we don't always know what helps. I think it, it depends on each individual. I, I still think, I think diet is still the very most important thing. And eating, uh, there's a book called The Color Code where they recommend eight to nine color servings a day which means you know, fruits, vegetables, anything that has natural color is gonna be richer in phytonutrients and antioxidants. And, so, and I know in the Anti-Cancer Lifestyle book, he's really big on getting the colorful foods into your diet. Okay, well, I think we're out of time. Thank you every, everyone for coming today and hopefully this was helpful.